please welcome AJC Global Director of Young Leadership, Sefi Kogan. Good afternoon, everyone. In addition to being AJC's Global Director of Young Leadership in my spare time, I host AJC's podcast, AJC Passport. That's our weekly podcast. That's our weekly podcast that analyzes global affairs through a Jewish lens. Folks, together we are going to be a part of something historic right here at the AJC Global Forum. This right now is about to be the largest ever live audience for an AJC Passport episode. What does it mean to be part of a live show of a podcast? Well, I'll tell you. When you clap, our audience will hear it. When you laugh, our audience will hear that too. When you sneeze, you get the idea. And please, don't sneeze. Later this week, you can listen to the episode of AJC Passport by heading to our website, ajc.org slash passport, um, or by just going on your phone to the uh, Apple or Google uh, podcast app. And by the way, those directions will also work for you to share it with your friends and family so that they can subscribe and listen, uh, listen in to the episode that you're about to see. So in just a moment, we're going to start the recording. Um, before we do, I thought um, I would warm all of you up. Um, so on the count of three, can we get a test round of applause? What? Not yet, not yet. <laughs> One, two, three. Perfect. This is perfect. Okay, here we go. Hello, and welcome to a very special AJC Global Forum live show of AJC Passport. <laughs> Longtime listeners to AJC Passport will know that we often talk about three main sources of anti Semitism in the world. Those three sources are the far left, the far right, and certain radical segments of the Muslim community. The most prominent and alarming manifestation of far-left anti-Semitism is today's British Labour Party and its leader, Jeremy Corbyn. It, it is a party that has been cited for uh, harboring institutional anti-Semitism. Uh, whether that takes the form of uh, blatantly anti-Jewish comments masquerading as criticism of Israel, uh, statements of support for terrorist groups Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, or age-old conspiracy theories about Jewish power controlling uh, financial markets, uh, media institutions, and the government. Too many leaders in the Labour Party have been complicit, or at the very least apathetic, about this rise of anti-Semitism. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been those courageous few who've stood up within the party, uh, like our friend uh, John Mann, a member of parliament who we here at Global Forum will hear from tomorrow. Um, but the largest uh, bit of news uh, about all of this was the defection that took place in February when several members of parliament from the Labour Party uh, left. Um, some of them even set up a new uh, party themselves. We now have two of those Labour defectors uh, with us today. So please welcome members of Parliament Joan Ryan and Ian Austin. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Well, Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Many on the left have sought to, um, to downplay uh, the importance of, of your leaving the Labour Party by saying, well, you weren't all that left-wing before anyway. Uh, is, is that true? Can you, can you each tell us, Joan, maybe we'll start with you, can you tell us a little bit uh, about what brought you to the Labour Party in the first place? Well, they didn't say that for the 38 years I was a member. So. <laughs> took them a heck of a time to reach that conclusion. I joined the Labour Party um, because of its values, and they coincided most closely with my values, values centred around equality, which is the founding principle of Labour, which is why it's so awful where Labour is now, because it should be the frontline defence against any kind of intolerance or racism. But 
I didn't really lead the Labour Party, it left me. It left those values of decency, equality, respect, um, tolerance, live and let live, all those things, and they manifested themselves in the shape of this appalling anti-Semitism that we see. And, and Ian? Well, thanks, Sefi. I mean, my dad came to Britain in 1939 as a 10-year-old Jewish refugee from Ostrava in Czechoslovakia. He was the only member of his family to escape. His mother and sisters were murdered in Treblinka. And so I grew up, not Jewish myself, but I grew up listening to him tell me about the Holocaust, tell me about racism and prejudice, tell me that these things were wrong. And it was because of that, it was, it was to fight racism, really, that I joined the Labour Party as a teenager 35 years ago. And I could not have believed that I would be leaving the Labour Party because of racism too. That's why I left. I left because Jeremy Corbyn, I think, has poisoned the Labour Party with an appalling culture of intolerance and anti-Semitism. And so my values haven't changed at all. I left to fight racism in exactly the same way as I joined the Labour Party all those years ago as a teenager. Now, I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine, and, and I invite our audience members to uh, imagine with me, the, the analog here in America, right? Imagine if, um, you know, 10 or so uh, members of the Democratic Party or of the Republican Party, you know, members of Congress from the party were to say, you know, forget about it. It's not for me. And, and, and to actually leave. Uh, and, and to continue to, to represent uh, their, their districts in Congress, either as an independent or as a member of a new party, um, that would be an absolute political earthquake. Is, is, is that the way that, that your leaving was, was felt in, in the UK? Yes, I think so. I think it was a political earthquake. It um, covered the news all of that week. It had a big impact on Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party's poll ratings. And I think, uh, obviously Ian can speak for himself, but I think for both of us, we left because of this anti-Semitism, because of this racism towards Jews. And I think as we did that, we were very aware that you only get one go at that. You can't resign week in, week out. You can't walk <laughs> away from your party more than once. And that it's, it's for good once you've done that. And so I think both of us worked very hard in the 24 hours surrounding having done that to ensure that the people in the United Kingdom and in our constituencies and in the Labour Party understood exactly why we had done this, that that was the opportunity to absolutely draw back the curtain on what was happening in the Labour Party and that the Labour Party was infected with anti-Semitism, that the Labour Party, it wasn't just a case of a few bad apples, that what we were seeing here, what we were witnessing, was institutional anti-Semitism in its very organisation, in its processes, in its complete unwillingness and inability, because of its ideology, to tackle this anti-Semitism. And that's, that's the phrase, institutionally anti-Semitic, that uh, Member of Parliament Luciana Berger, um, one, of, one of actually only a few uh, Jewish members of Parliament who left the Labour sure. Party, um, that, that she used at that memorable press conference, um, that's about as strong an indictment as I could possibly imagine. Ian, is there anything that the Labour Party could do to regain respectability at this point? Uh, look, I think it's... I think it's very difficult to see how that could happen under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership because I think he has spent 30 or 40 years working with all sorts of extremists. Um, he, and he has this view of himself that he is so virtuous that he has sort of impeccable anti-racist credentials, that he could not possibly be guilty of racism, and so this must all, he thinks, be a plot and a smear and a campaign to undermine him, and, and, and he genuinely believes, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, he really believes that he is the victim in all of this. So not only does he not understand that it's a problem, if he did understand it, he wouldn't be able to solve it. If he wanted to, I mean, if he was capable of solving it, I don't think he would want to. I think he, he, he really doesn't. He's incapable of understanding the scale of this. And so I think it is very difficult to see how the Labour Party can be saved. But look, I left because I wanted to it's not like I walked away from a fight. 
I think it was an act of uh, taking the fight on this issue to Corbyn uh, that I left. And I left in order to try and encourage other people in the Labour Party to step up and do the right thing too. And there are some signs of that, although not nearly enough. Joan, um, this week it was announced that the Equality and Human Rights Commission in the UK, the uh, EHRC, um, is going to launch a formal inquiry uh, into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Uh, can you explain to our audience, first of all, what that body is and, and why this is a significant step? This is the commission in the United Kingdom that um, assesses whether an organisation has crossed that line and um, crossed the line of, of equalities and human rights. We have quite a lot of good legislation around equalities and human rights and they will make an independent investigation which we've called for for some time into what's happening in the Labour Party. We've had all kinds of incidents, I'm sure everybody is aware of some of them, but week in, week out there's another incident and we've had death threats against uh, Jewish members of Parliament and, and others and the Labour Party has not informed them of this. We've had people say in the most incredibly vile um, things that you just could not believe would ever have been said in the Labour Party uh, prior to Jeremy Corbyn's election in 2015. And they've hidden it, they've interfered. The leader's office, the evidence is now, through many, many leaked emails, that they've hidden this evidence and that they've interfered in the uh, process by which this kind of, the disciplinary process, in other words. So there is a great deal of evidence that they're covering it up, they're colluding with this, they're making it happen. It's an absolute indictment of the Labour Party because the only other political party that's been investigated or looked into in this way is the BMP, the British National Party, the far-right party. Because, of course, you know, this kind of thing is not um, the preserve of the far left. We see it on the far right as well. But I say again, the Labour Party, the very party, the first line of defence against this kind of racism and intolerance is being investigated by our Equality and Human Rights Commission. It's frankly quite unbelievable. But what really worries me, I'm very pleased they're doing it, but I'm very worried that the reaction in the UK to what's happening in the Labour Party is not what it should be. It's becoming normalised. And that's why I think it was important um, what Luciana Burgess said, what I've said, what Ian said about this is not to be tolerated. It is wrong and we can't be complicit with it. And I hope many more MPs will leave. I know they agree with us. They tell us behind the scenes. They need to have the courage of their convictions. If you're not in politics, to stand up for what you believe in, to do the right thing on behalf of your constituents and everybody else, I don't know what the purpose of being in politics is if it's not that. Do you have faith in the EHRC's process? Well, I've no reason not to have, I should say. As I say, um, they looked at the BMP, but they didn't have to launch a, a, a full inquiry. Mm -hmm. It was quite clear what was going on in the BMP. Um, so I haven't got a lot to measure it against, um, but I have no reason not to be. They've been considered um, in their approach. They approached the Labour Party who didn't even take their initial response to the National Executive Committee. There is no democracy in the way the Labour Party runs at the moment at all. They didn't take it to their National Executive Body that runs the party. Um, two of Jeremy Corbyn's appointees who work in the leader's office, uh, one of whom is General Secretary, they worded the response. So we don't know what it says. There's no reason Ian and I should know anymore. We're not actually in the <laughs> Labour Party. <laughs> but the Labour Party don't know either, and neither do their national body. But, uh, you know, is any of this a surprise? We're talking about a leader who calls Hamas and Hezbollah his friends. For those of us who are Anglophiles, and I, I count myself in among, among that number, um, 
we're, we're watching the UK uh, with maybe a little bit of a sense of dismay. Um, and, and we're seeing, um, you know, labor seems to be, uh, I, I guess the technical term is a dumpster fire. Um, and, um, but, but, but we're not seeing much uh, better from the conservatives. You would think that someone would be capitalizing on one side or the other of the aisle, but in fact, even as, as conservatives' political fortune, uh, fortunes head downward, uh, labors are not trending upward, which should be considered an indictment of the leader. Uh, Ian, if, if there were a, a leadership election to be held tomorrow, uh, in the Labour Party, would, would Jeremy Corbyn win again? I think he probably would. I mean, I think he would. I think that the truth is the Labour Party membership has increased massively, but that's because lots of people from fringe organisations and outside the Labour Party have joined to support, uh, to support his, uh, his policies. But look, Jeremy Corbyn and the people around him have taken what was a mainstream political party, the political party of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, steadfast supporters of Israel, uh, completely on the side of Britain's Jewish community, and they've turned it into something completely different, way off on the fringes of British politics, on the, on the hard left, and that's because he spent 30 years of his, uh, of, of his entire time in politics mixing with and defending all sorts of extremists, and in some cases, terrorists and, and anti-Semites. And the point Joan was making earlier about the, the EHRC investigation, this is really, really critical. I mean, this is a statutory organization. It has the legal powers, to, uh, to seek evidence, to demand emails and, uh, and, and all sorts of other records. And so for this to be happening, for them to believe that there is a case to be answered, that the Labour Party has, 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 has discriminated against Jewish people and, is responsible and has become institutionally anti-Semitic is utterly seismic, absolutely seismic. It's an absolute scandal. It's something that every Labour MP and every Labour Party member should be deeply ashamed of and all of them should be working night and day to put this right. Here's... Absolutely. Here's what I'm worried about. What I'm worried about is that you are not just visitors from the other side of the Atlantic, but that you're visitors from the future. I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. I, apropos of the conversation that happened uh, just a few minutes ago um, about political homelessness um, in this country, for American Jews in this country, um, I think it's not that hard to see, to, to draw a straight line from where we stand today in 2019 America to a situation that looks something like what you are encountering um, in the United Kingdom uh, with the Labour Party. Uh, I, I'm not going to point fingers here as to whether uh, you know, we could be talking about, I, I think there's a case to be made that we could be talking about the Democratic Party or we could be talking about the Republican Party. Um, with that in mind, Joan, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll actually ask both of you, but Joan, what lessons do you have for us from the future, as it were? What, what can we do, what should we do now in order to kind of arrest the slide that our parties are taking? We have reflected on this quite a lot, um, and I think it is important that others in different parts of the world look at what's happened to us because it happened so fast and it's gone so deep that really it is quite unbelievable. So I think you have to be ever vigilant. I think the first lesson is you call out anti-Semitism wherever, whenever you come across it and you do it right from the beginning. You don't wait. Pretty well. It's like a virus, and if you don't do that right from day one, right from the first instance, then it will take a hold, and that's what's happened in the Labour Party. I think the, the second lesson um, I would identify is that you have to be very clear about what your red lines are. Where is it that you say... anti-Semitism, I knew that what she was saying was true. I watched her on my TV screen and I could not but act in solidarity with her. I knew what she was saying was the truth. I'd already crossed more red lines than I thought I would, 
And I think it's really important that people, parties, groups, caucuses, whatever, work out what their red line is and what they're going to do about it. And their red lines need to be attached to their traditional values and to, um, to the values. You know, if ours had been attached to the traditional values of the Labour Party, maybe more Labour MPs would have left. But we'd already crossed a lot of red lines. I think you've got to try and avoid that. And I, I also think we've got to understand that you can't deal with a hard left leadership um, in the way you would deal with a normal party leadership. And they operate differently. They're secretive and obsessive and obsessed with purity. Um, and you've got to be very careful with them that you don't fall into trading mm. access for your silence. And that has happened in the Labour Party uh, with their various inquiries that people have participated in, or we will give some training to members, and it's like buying you off. At, at, at best, naive. At, at worst, it makes us complicit. You have to recognise that it's highly unlikely you're going to get very far at all. That isn't the way you're going to solve this problem, by engaging with it. And I think we also have to understand that we've got a lot of work to do in not just um, the public, but parliamentarians themselves, members of Congress, members of whatever, understanding the real challenge we face in communicating what anti-Zionist anti-Semitism is and helping people to understand it. And whilst we're doing that, um, we've got to find the language with which to do that, because they're very busy saying, they're just trying to close down criticism of Israel. It's just a smear. These are easy lines to roll out. And finally, I'd say this mustn't be a council of despair, that we've got to offer hope. We have to know what we're for, not just what we're against. I'm a big fan and supporter of the um, International Fund for Israeli and Palestinian Peace. And I think particularly for young people, they can be drawn to BDS, not because they want to demonize and delegitimize Israel, but because they want to do something. They want to be active. We've got to offer the alternative that doesn't drive people apart, but brings Israelis and Palestinians together in coexistence, people to people work. I, I see that we're out of time. So folks, let's get one more round of applause, please, for Joan Ryan and Ian Austin. Now it's time. Now it's time for our closing segment, Good for the Jews, where each week I share one final thought about a recent development in the world and try to answer that age-old question. Is it good for the Jews? <laughs> Washington, DC. Good for the Jews? One of the first Jewish residents of Washington was Isaac Pollock, who arrived in 1795 and finished the construction of the brick buildings to the west of the White House that would be used to house the State Department and later serve as the home of James Madison and Martin Van Buren. In 1852, 21 newly arrived Jews created the first synagogue in the district, the Washington Hebrew Congregation. In order to guarantee the right of the Jewish community to own land, Congress passed an act for the benefit of the Hebrew Congregation in the city of Washington, which was signed into law by President Franklin Pierce in 1856. 13 years later, Following the timeless tradition of disgruntled members forming a breakaway synagogue, <laughs> Addis Israel Congregation was formed. President Ulysses S. Grant donated to the building fund, and when construction on the synagogue was completed on the American Centennial in 1876, Grant attended the dedication. A remarkable turnaround for the general who had once expelled all Jews from territory he controlled during the Civil War. Today, the DC metro area is the third largest uh, Jewish community in the United States with 300,000 Jews. And our government institutions are plenty Jewish too. 36 of the 535 members of both houses of Congress are Jewish, as are three of the nine Supreme Court justices. However, despite what New York Magazine and Fox News once printed about Barack Obama and Donald Trump respectively, there hasn't yet been a Jewish president. As I look out at this crowd and see an audience of over 2,500 committed Jews and allies gathered in our nation's capital, I cannot help 
but be inspired by our community, this city, and our nation. We have 300 college students from some of the finest universities in the world, many of which once severely limited the number of Jews who could attend. We will dine with ambassadors from dozens of countries speaking truth to power and letting them know that our community cares deeply about the affairs of the world. And we will go to Congress en masse, meeting with our elected representatives as proud Americans petitioning our government. Washington might have its challenges and bashing this city will never go out of style. But Washington, D.C. is undoubtedly good for the Jews. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant.